I've had several requests from the vinyl community to show my piano room and talk about my pianos a little bit. To begin with here, I'm just going to give you a quick introduction to the room. This is a 27-inch iMac I use for recording. It also has a MIDI editor here, which you can see what looks like a player piano roll on the screen through the USB cable down there on the floor going over to this piano which is the newest technology this is a Yamaha 7 foot 6 inch Pro Series Disclavier piano and uh, you notice I didn't straighten up the room ahead of time what's the sheetrock leaning against the wall what's the 4x8 sheetrock on the floor well this room is very dead and we use a lot of in-the-box reverb for mixing and mastering now, so a dead room is just fine. But when I have a pianist sitting here playing kind of in a corner, he needs to hear the notes coming back at him a little bit better when he's playing subtle stuff. So we got sheetrock on the floor and sheetrock up against the end of the piano to add a little more reverb. Here is a custom-made piano roll cabinet. I had these made many years ago. I had four of them. And on this cabinet are about 450 rolls. But I've had thousands of rolls, and I had four of these cabinets completely full of rolls and more rolls than would fit. I'll talk about that a little more in the demonstrations. Here is my 1911 Steinway foot pump player piano. Uh, I had this piano and the player mechanism completely restored about 30 years ago, and it still plays great. I'm going to do a little demonstration and play a tune at each piano, talk about the rolls a little bit, talk about the technology a little bit, and if you're interested, stay tuned. I'll be back with more. And if you're not interested, 2 minutes, 40 seconds, that's about the right amount. Thanks. Here is my 1911 Steinway foot pump player piano. Uh, I thought it would be as good to be able to see the pumps a little bit as to see my head in the video. This, after all, is about the piano. I got my first player piano in about 1967 or 1968, and what got me interested in that was the music. I was into the early jazz, blues, and ragtime, and I read Jelly Roll Morton's biography and the book They All Played Ragtime. I found out Jelly Roll Morton, Scott Joplin, Fats Waller, James P. Johnson, all of these people made player piano rolls. Of course, all the classical people made them also, Rachmaninoff, Arthur Rubinstein, Horowitz when he was a very young man. And so if you want to hear those early pianists, a player piano is the way to do it. What is important with these is, is that before, really around 1930, very few solo piano recordings were made because the recording technology before electrification, electric mics and amplifiers became fully utilized. They just didn't record good, and so if you want to know what the people played the piano like in 1923, you're not going to find out by listening to an old 78 recording you're going to find out by listening to a player piano roll, and that's what got me interested in it. One of the things uh, about the player piano is, is if you pump faster, it gets louder. If you pump slower, it gets softer. We have controls down here. I can control the tempo. I can speed it up, slow it down, so that you get the tempo the way you think it should be played. This is great for pianists because where they're trying to learn a tricky passage, you can slow the tempo down without, of course, any change in pitch. 
and they can watch the keys and back it up and go back and forth until they figure it out. And I've had a number of pianists do that to learn some of the tricks of the old timers, kind of like you guitar guys watching their fingers when they play. Uh, this is my area of expertise musically because for 30 or 40 years I focused on player piano roles, particularly the black popular music of pre-1930. And when we say that, we're talking about jazz, blues, and ragtime. And my specialty in that area, area was the piano. I also collected sheet music. I had one of the largest collections of original blues and jazz sheet music pre-1930. And this is where a lot of the research has to come from because there wasn't that much written back then. And of course, since then, all the focus has primarily been on the guitar players and the piano guys have all been left out of it. So uh, I'm gonna play a role and uh, one of the other things is is that uh, the uh, heart of the the peak of player piano uh, production was 1923 and i believe the peak of roll sales was 1926. well the peak of the blues era when blues was the most popular bessie smith all of those kind of people the most recordings were being issued was 1923 and that was the peak of the player pianos. So all the great pianists, uh, most of which would be people you have never heard of and are unknown today, made piano rolls. One of my favorites, one I've focused on for many years, Jimmy Bly, James Bly, he was the house pianist for Paramount Records recorded under his name, pseudonyms with different groups, composed tons of music. He's extremely important in the music history today and uh, was part of that Chicago scene. After World War I, there was a, literally a r river of uh, black Americans moving from the South to Chicago where all the jobs were and the music scene there exploded. Uh, Jelly Roll Morton moved up to Chicago, King Oliver moved up there and brought uh, a little bit later Louis Armstrong up from New Orleans. All the pianists were there, everything was going there. And uh, a lot of these people didn't survive too long, like Jimmy Bly, he died in 1931. And uh, the person I'm gonna play a piano role here is uh, Everett Robbins. This piano roll was recorded in 1924. Uh, I don't think he lived too awful long after that. He's mostly an unknown person. He is most famous for the famous song been done by many times over the years, Taint Nobody's Business, If I Do. He was the co-composer of that. He only made a few piano rolls and so this is one of the ways we can hear what these guys sound like and see them play. Yes, the roles were edited slightly, but it gives you a really good impression of what the person played like. And so uh, we're going to listen here to Everett Robbins play his composition, Hard Luck Blues. <laughs>
I think you will agree that that sounds a lot better than a scratchy old 78 where they played into a big wooden horn. Yes, Everett Robbins was black and of course a little bit of his tune that you just heard there you would have had to been over in the south side of Chicago if you wanted to hear anything played like this. And uh, it's about four, a little over four minutes long. I only played half of it here. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you're still with me, we're going to move over to the modern technology and we'll try a couple other piano gigs. So stay tuned. Just give you a little overview of player piano rolls here, and yes, the good stuff, just like on records, is fairly scarce to rare today and hard to find. These piano rolls with the black pianist were sold primarily just like the race records were into those communities, and the rolls are quite scarce today. All of the rolls you see on the shelf here are recuts, reissues. And when I got interested in the late 60s, I found out the music I wanted was not available. The main company, QRS, been in business continuous, uh, except for during the war way back then. And they reissued a bunch of them. But in 1970, I moved to California and through a series of coincidences, I met uh, a large collector who knew other large collectors around the country and a person who knew people in Central California that had rebuilt the old perforating equipment and were able to duplicate piano rolls. So in the early 1970s, I reissued nearly 600 rolls, borrowing rare rolls from collectors all over the country to have them duplicated. In some cases at the time, it was the only known copy of that piano roll. The Everett Robbins that I just played uh, probably was the only known copy of that one, I don't know. Back then, we didn't have the internet, and so the few collectors that knew each other, that's what we knew now of course a uh, little more stuff gets discovered because uh, people who would only have a casual interest can find the people who are really interested uh, as i said i had thousands of roles and i consolidated the collection down to the ones that i thought were outstanding and ones that i might actually listen to now on to modern technology Don't know if you can see me here or not, folks. Uh, sorry about the little unprofessional uh, job doing this recording, but didn't have anyone to help. I originally thought about setting up some good mics to get a little bit better sound, and then I couldn't find one of the connectors I needed. And I just wanted to get kind of a little video together here if anybody had any interest to show what it was like. This piano is a 2013 state-of-the-art technology Yamaha Conservatory, seven foot six inch grand conservatory, generally being the highest quality pianos they made. This is seven foot six. The next largest size piano would be a concert grand. Don't need a piano this big in your home. You need a piano this big for recording because the bigger the piano, the better the sound, particularly in the bass. I've had four of these pianos. I got the first one when the first Yamaha Disc Clavier Grands came out. Why? You saw the player piano stuff. Well, that was great, but how about getting some modern pianists that can really play to play the same music so that we have all the dynamics, so that we have the live performance. Uh, and that's how I got into recording. So over the last 30 years, 25, 30 years, I've recorded, produced, and co-produced over 35 CDs of ragtime, early jazz, and blues piano music. Much of it on my label, Piano Mania, and some of it for larger labels and a number for artists. 
what makes this piano important is, is that some of you have probably seen a player grand or a modern electric player piano at the mall, uh, maybe at a Nordstrom's or someplace like that, and maybe even in somebody's home. This piano's a little different, they all look the same, but about 98% chance of what you saw was what I would call the consumer version. This is a special order called the Pro Series Disc Clavier. Anybody can get one. Uh, they are more expensive. They were designed specifically for people like me who do recording and need the accuracy, okay? So the Pro Series Disc Clavier records three times more data than a regular disc clavier does. Key let off, all kinds of information that's important to a sensitive, subtle playback. And it plays back eight times more accurate. So a regular consumer disc clavier, yes, if you have good ears and you hear the live performance and the immediate playback, you can tell a little bit with the difference. With this piano, there is no difference between the live performance and the playback, so it's perfect for recording. Um, one of the reasons that I got into the recording, kind of like the piano rolls, I got the piano, well, not much music. What's popular isn't early jazz, blue, and ragtime. That's not what Yamaha was doing. Now, Dick Hyman, which many of you are familiar with, did record three discs for Yamaha for the disc clavier, so they have those, and those are outstanding. I'm going to play a tune in a second, or a little bit of it, of the uh, famous Canadian pianist, I say famous, you probably won't know it, but John Arpin, and uh, who is not with us anymore. Another great thing about this technology is, is that the things that I will play for you today are all people who are no longer with us. So once they record on technology like this, you got the live performance. Yeah, they've recorded on the recordings, but it is not the same as seeing and hearing the live performance on a quality piano. So uh, those two artists recorded for Yamaha and in the jazz blue ragtime era. Now modern jazz, there's a lot more choice, but in the early stuff, there's very little. So just like I did with the piano rolls, you need them, you get in the business of producing them. Uh, for many years, I've produced and sold very limited demand MIDI file discs for people who have control, computer controlled pianos, or you can even play them on keyboards or whatever. Uh, I've recorded uh, people from all over the world. I've had people here from Norway, from the United Kingdom, from Australia, from Hungary, and all over the United States, and it has been a lot of fun. Uh, won't go on too much about this, of course, like you can imagine, I could talk forever, but we're going to play a little bit of the old pop tune, Poor Butterfly. This is John Arpin. He died seven or eight years ago. A few of you might know him. He did 20 years ago. He did a recording, I think, on Telarc, a CD, really high quality, Ragtime Beatles, and he took all the Beatles' most popular songs and wrote Ragtime Arrangements and recorded them, and for many years that was my test CD to compare recordings to as to what a high quality grand piano recording should sound like. Uh, I don't have him playing any Beatles, but uh, it's going to play a kind of a modern uh, what we might call cocktail piano dinner music kind of version of Poor Butterfly. He had fantastic technique and could play all kinds of music. So here is John Arpin.
busy if you see the keys going back and forth. That's how the soft pedal actuates on a uh, high quality brand piano. every nuance of what the person played. The touch, the dynamics, the pedaling, everything is is recorded perfectly into in the earlier pianos, a hard drive in the piano. Now they go into a flash drive. The piano has a place for a CD-ROM. It has a place to insert a flash drive. They did away with floppies, but I, through a USB port to have a floppy drive. I've got uh, I've got probably a hundred discs recorded by Yamaha. Much of it classical music, modern jazz, all kind of music, anything you want. And I have thousands of files that I've recorded, and thousands of files that were re that were uh, done from player piano rolls where they were scanned into and converted to MIDI files, and so it's virtually unlimited. Uh, again, the few of you that are still with me, the next little bit of the video, I'm going to go over to the computer, probably have to hand hold the camera here, and I'm going to show you a little bit about the computer, the software, and you can see the computer play the piano. Now, when I do an audio recording, of course, you have to set up microphones and record just like in any recording. The interesting thing here is, is, is that uh, the file I'm going to play from the other place is a person from Australia. I recorded four CDs for them. Uh, they died six or seven years ago, again, at only 57 years of, of age. They're here. They record. I edit the music after they're gone, and then when we set up the microphones to do the actual audio recording, the computer is going to play the piano, and in this case, the pianist is 8,000 miles away. Another advantage with this technology is, those of you that are knowledgeable about recording, you move a microphone a few inches, you rotate it a few degrees, you just change the sound. You can experiment virtually unlimited here because it's going to play back precisely the same every time, which an actual pianist could not do. So uh, you can experiment as much as you want, and I, uh, I hope this is a little interest to a few of you, so over to the computer. I've seen that this is going to be a pretty long video and very few of you will be interested. I'm setting at the iMac here. You're seeing what looks like a player piano roll on the screen. It's kind of upside down and backwards. The left hand is on the bottom, the right hand is on the top. But with this software, we can edit everything. We can edit the pedals, we can edit the notes, we can delete them, add them, lengthen them, shorten them, uh, take out the clams, whatever. And uh, again, I won't go on about this. I'm just going to do a little quick demo here. Uh, 
You might wonder why don't this look like a musical notation representation and some of the software will put up musical notation representation. Again, I won't bore you with the technical difficulties in that, but the piano roll display is far easier to edit. And those of you who read music, I can read this piano roll scrolling along just about like you read the sheet music. So I got my old friend from Australia, John Gill, going to play a little bit of Stormy Weather. This was a spontaneous, unrehearsed take, one take and a little bit of editing. Now, of course, he was one of the top stride pianists. That was like what ja James P. Johnson and Fats Waller did. He can play anything, virtually any tune he ever heard he could play. But he would often spend three, four, five days with me. He liked to play the piano, and I would just name tunes, and he would play them. And this is a spontaneous one-off take of John Gill playing Stormy Weather. Uh, I can speed them up, slow them down, all of that kind of stuff. I can zoom in, zoom out. But uh, here we go. You see the... scrolling that's exactly where the notes are playing If there's anybody left, I want to thank you for watching. This uh, video going to be 30 minutes long. Uh, not as professional as I could have did, but I'm um, lazy, as I've mentioned, in my old age, and I just kind of wanted to do it. I did it all on my iPhone, and of course, the sound quality then is just what the iPhone can do, but I think it gives you a good representation. And, uh, you know, the technology just keeps marching on, but it's another part of the enjoyment of music. And so, see you on down the trail.